Welcome back to the Mediocre Spider-Man, which is the name of the show, not necessarily the games. This begs repeating. I'm the one that's mediocre. Aww. Since we've already covered most of the arachnid-based gaming that blessed the end of the late 2000s, why not finish it off? I mean, I think we'll have a great time. Time! Quebec-based Beanox Entertainment had begun spinning a second web as soon as pre-order numbers had come in for Shattered Dimensions. Check out that video here. Unfortunately, our good friends at Activision realized they now had a cheap, thanks Quebec tax breaks, Spider-Man factory that they could now exploit. Beanox's dimension hopping gamble had paid off, and just like the flurry of Spider-based releases we saw in 2007 and 2008, top Activision butthead said, hey, that worked out great, so let's have these guys make one game a year every year until we get diminishing returns. Activision. So with the mandate to begin an assembly line of spider titles, that meant Le Boys down at Beanox would have a little less than a year to put together a new game, but of course realized that making something of Shattered Dimension's ambition and length was simply an impossibility. Thus, the idea of making a full-fledged sequel was dropped, and slotted into its place was more of a spin-off that would need to reuse a lot of the same animations, assets, special effects, gameplay, and would need to be a hell of a lot shorter. You know, they had to use every part of the spider carcass. Now, that's not inherently a bad thing, because Shattered Dimensions was so fresh and so fun, the recycling parts of it would have to produce something decent, right? Well then, Spider Files turn to the next page of this exciting issue of the mediocre spider mat, and let's find out. So, the first thing Beanox needed to do was cut down the Spider Boys by half, and rather smartly, decided to focus on two of the most popular, the amazing Peter Man of 616 and the marvelous Miguel, also of 616, but circa 2099. I know there's another name you could call that continuity, it doesn't matter, nerds, it's just, it's just 2099. To help them hone in on these characters, they brought on Peter David, who some of you might know as the co-creator of Spider-Man 2099. That's a pretty good call. The story and dialogue was primarily handled by him, with assistance by other creative leads at Beanox. The trick was to finding a way to connect just two Spider-Men without relying on the tablet of space and time and convenience again. The solution, of course, would be one of the most stock villain types in Spider history. Dorky, uncharismatic, evil inventors, and there's nobody that inhabits all those traits than Walker Sloan. He's got a get-rich-quick scheme that he's positive will get him rich. And quick. Since he's like a time scientist, he uses his uh, Stargate to travel back to the bell bottoms and disco suits of the 70s. With his advanced future brain, he plans to open Alchemax 2099's Amazon even earlier, which of course would muck things up for both Peter and Miguel. Speaking of Miguel, he's actually too late to stop Sloan from quantum leaping, and when this happens, a chronal link, a fancy word for mind codec, is established between himself and 616's Peter. While stopping Sloan's lame-ass plan is what kicks things off, what's even more pressing is that Miguel got a flash of a, a time vision that showed Peter dying at the hands of Anti-Venom, who also happens to be running around inside Alchemax, which is something they're both concerned about. To prevent this untimely end, both spider dudes are gonna have to get along with the decisions and actions they each make affecting the other due to QUANTUM CAUSALITY! Trademark. Along the way, they'll need to contend with a few villains, both new and old, bulging atrocities, and a whole lot of key collecting. That's the basic setup, minus some details. For what's essentially just a story about Nakatomi Plaza being under siege twice at the same time, just centuries apart, this is a unique and fascinating little narrative that's oddly compelling, which makes it all the more disappointing that Edge of Time's other elements aren't quite on the same level. Really, it's Peter David's expertise at delivering snappy, quip-filled comic book dialogue which holds everything together. If, say, this had the writing quality of, oh, I don't know, Web of Shadows, then yeah, Edge of Time would nearly be remembered as fondly by some as it is. Cops will be here soon to gather you up and put you back in the coop. Coop? <laughs> I'm on a roll. 
All right, let's get started with the good stuff. While Edge of Time takes some of the better ideas from Shattered Dimensions, it can't take all of them. But where it does shine in that oh so very shiny 2099 way is in its combat and upgrade trees. There is a lot to unlock and play around with and does a good job of making both Spideys feel pretty distinct, even though they also share a pool of specific moves and functions as well. Miguel is all about sweeping melee strikes with his talons, much like he was in Shattered Dimensions, but movesets have changed slightly to be far more effective in taking out huge numbers of baddies, like dozens at a time, which is something Miguel excels at. His defensive ability is to produce a holographic after image which distracts foes long enough for him to launch into some smoking sick combos. This makes for some of the most visceral and violent feeling combat in a spider game as you tear through all these mobs of robots, security goons, and various kinds of oozing mutants. Miguel can unlock ground slams, spinning breakdancing special moves, but nothing's as cool as his decoy strike, which launches one of his after images forward at an enemy, grabbing them by the throat and hauling them back towards you, and <laughs> looks so goddamn cool. Peter, meanwhile, relies much more on his webs, as you might expect. He can turn them into hammers, make giant AoE blasts, and can fling enemies in the air like he just don't care. Whenever you're controlling Mr. Parker in a fight, you'll know it, as most of the area will be covered in plenty of sticky webbing. Ah, that, uh, that didn't sound right. Uh, let me take that again. The entire room will be coated in a warm torrent of sloshy musky goo. His defensive ability isn't quite spider sense, there's a story reason for that, but hyper sense, which allows him to leg it pretty fast. This comes in handy to clear lasers and other traps. Finally, he comes equipped with a web strike like move, which propels him forward in combat, giving him an extra bit of mobility when compared to his slightly edgier and much more futuristic counterpart. As previously stated, they share a number of common techniques, such as the time paradox. You changed the future! You've created a time paradox! What this does is slow down anyone who's caught within the time bubble circumference, letting you build up a lot of damage really quickly. What's great about all these upgrades, even if you exhaustively collect every bit of XP or collectible, is that you'll most likely not be able to buy absolutely everything on your first run. There's always going to be a few lingering techniques left to buy or upgrade, which means the XP system was tested pretty exhaustively. One of my pet peeves in combat heavy action titles like this is too much game, not enough to unlock. This of course leads to some replayability, which of course is a crutch that Edge of Time had to lean on. Another aspect I'm glad they included was the Web of Challenges system, which was again, say it with me, a hand-me-down from Shattered Dimensions. This time, however, since the game is kind of on the short side, these are way harder to complete, but the rewards are so great. Each chapter of the game has interconnected many challenges, like kill 12 enemies in 10 seconds, web swing for an extended period of time, which is harder than you'd think, and stuff like that. Once you've completed all these mini challenges in the group, the reward at the center of the web unlocks, which most of the time is a costume key, which lets you dip into some of that famous spider drip. More on that later. Something else I'm happy is back for their sophomore year is the Golden Spiders, which honestly are a really enjoyable distraction. They're found throughout the Alchemex building, sometimes in plain sight, sometimes deviously hidden, and sometimes earned through combat, but they're always fun to grab. Once you've collected enough spider jiggies, uh -huh. You can then cash them in to upgrade your health, adrenaline bar, defensive power, all the stuff that keeps our Spider-Mans alive. I really want this goofy thing to return. I'm looking at you, Insomniac! Now, with that said, it's a very, very good thing all this combat feels fluid and fun because it's what you spend 90% of Edge of Time doing. The other 10% is listening to some authentic and entertaining back and forths between Miguel and Peter. Parker, stop screwing around and get me out of this! I'm not a time travel expert. How do I... Wait, 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 wait. What if I just trash the robotic research facility? Is that worth a try? Anything's worth a try. Over with. Stop yelling at me! Going back to this game has really made me appreciate just what David accomplished here. Perfect characterizations of two different men with amazing powers. Miguel is more arrogant with a tendency for self-preservation. He's heroic, yes, but on his own terms, which were molded through the very different time which he's from. These 
his methods and his frequent Star Trek-like techno babble rubs Peter the wrong way, which results in clashes from time to time about what it means to be Spider-Man. O'Hara, if you don't get that I can't turn my back on danger, no matter what the cost, then you've got no business calling yourself Spider-Man. Peter, as we all know, is far more idealistic, selfless, and of course, just a tad bit stubborn. Just trust me, okay? Trust me, says the voice in my head. You know, this is how serial killers get started. He makes mistakes in this game and often doesn't listen to Miguel's advice, even when he's right. Throughout their campaign against Sloan and the mysterious Alchemax CEO, the relationship slowly changes and evolves, starting off as borderline antagonistic as soon as they become linked. Both heroes are definitely from two different times, but thankfully, there's a number of smart narrative beats which help them find common ground. All four Spider Boys in Shattered Dimensions didn't really interact with each other as Madame Web was the go-between, so this is something super unique to Edge of Time, and for me, it's the game best element. A close second is the voice cast. Josh Keaton, who played Ultimate Spider-Man last time around, slips into this game amazingly well. Sure, it's okay. Anything for you, babe. And I love when you call me Tiger. As he should, because ocelots are very, very talented. He's the perfect mix of boyish charm, sarcasm, and all the things that make up Spidey. On the literal flip side is Christopher Daniel Barnes, the Fox Kid Spider-Man, who absolutely nails O'Hara here. I keep trying to tell myself that I'm just jealous of Walker Sloan's progress. It was only five years ago that he first showed up at Alchemax talking about harnessing energy from the fourth dimension. Now he won't stop until he's running the place. One thing I didn't care for in Dimensions was some of the voice acting decisions. That's me, ready to save the universe and looking good while doing it. 2099 was hilariously miscast, just far too hammy for what is primarily a serious role. Like, wait, hammy? Wait, why didn't they just cast that 80s voice actor as Peter Porker? That would've been perfect. Anyway, Barnes brings this familiar confidence and for lack of a better term, edge to the role. Oscar Isaac is gonna have some big shoes to fill. I can't think of many or any other superhero games that grow their two main controllable characters in this way, and even when nothing particularly interesting is happening gameplay-wise, there's always a fun exchange going on between our two lovable spider bros. The rest of the cast is fine, I don't want to think of the amount of money wasted on Val Kilmer as Walker Sloan, who's only in a few quick scenes and maybe some audio logs, I don't even know if audio logs are in this game, I didn't check. But what we do have is the incomparable Steve Bloom as anti-venom slash Eddie Brock. He doesn't have a whole lot to do here if I'm gonna be honest, but he's always welcome. Just making it easier. Damn, how many spider villains has Steve played? All in all, for me at least, the narrative, dialogue, and voice acting compose the engine which drives the entire game, and save for some random, ineffective side plots, it remained entertaining throughout. The last thing that bears mentioning is something I think Edge of Time might do the best, save for the Insomniac stuff, out of the entire Web Swingers digital career, and that's costumes. There's some pulls in this thing, some deep, hard pulls. If you have a Shattered Dimension save, you gain access to a shitload of solid options. There's even more stuff I don't think I've ever seen before or since. A Hydra costume? Cosmic Spidey 2099? Dusk? Poison? Masked Marvel? Prodigy? All told, there's 26 different costumes spread across both Spideys. Only problem though, since this was published and marketed by Activision, there were a number of bullshit retailer exclusive pre-order costumes as well as exclusives to certain consoles. Even if you find a hard copy of this game, I'm pretty sure it's impossible to get absolutely everything. Still though, one of the most impressive and eclectic displays of spider fashion I've ever witnessed. Now, don't get me wrong, all this stuff is great, but for everything Edge of Time does well, it does something decidedly less well. As I've alluded to before, the entirety of this tale takes place within the slick hallways of the Alchemax building in two distinct time periods, but you need to strain your eyes to really notice. Even though Peter's sections are 100 years into the past, it's still an incredibly futuristic building. The story reasons for this are kind of far-fetched and tenuous, because the real reason is Beanox needed to reuse a lot of assets. You'll go through labs, elevator shafts, more labs, bigger labs, a few hallways, and after that, some labs. 
God, there's a lot of nerd stuff in here. You'll notice maybe one or two instances of the level designers going, oh shit, people are gonna get sick of looking at the same stuff over and over again. Hence the weird hydroponics garden biodome thing. Truthfully, whenever I think about Edge of Times' environments, they honestly blur together in a bloom-filled gray explosion of seventh generation shininess. To try and break up the monotony, the free fall sequences return from dimensions, and they return a little too much. While they look really sick, I've always found them squirrely to control. You know when you're doing this type of stuff in, say, Star Fox? Yeah, this doesn't feel as good as that. If these sections had to return, then it would have been nice to add some free-falling fighting with aerial enemies to spice things up. You saw some of that with the fight against Hobgoblin 2099 in Shattered D, but it's completely absent here. <laughs> I guess there wasn't any time to include- okay, let me look this up. Ah, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. The general problem here lies with the fact that one building can't house the level diversity of entire dimensions. In the last game, you saw jungles, city streets, oil rigs, dams, warehouses, etc. But because of the limitations we've already discussed, Beanox were backed into a corner on this. So much so that they needed to reuse certain sections of levels multiple times in this game. In fact, almost every boss fight always plays out in front of the Stargate thing, and not only that, there's only three villains you ever actually get to fight. All these rules and constrictions that Beanox had to abide by affect pretty much everything in the game. This is all especially disappointing because the idea of Edge of Time is bursting with all this untapped potential. There's a literal time storm going on. It's ripping reality apart, but the only thing that this results in is glitchy, warped images of like Mary Jane on the walls and uh, Peter's name tag changes. Think about all the things that could happen when you start screwing with the space-time continuum, all right? You got it? Now try to contain all those same comic book fantasies within one singular office building. Beanox tried to spin this into the cause and effect gameplay system, which for my money is as phony as blast processing or trying to make a viable device which relies exclusively on streaming video games. Edge of Time really wants to convince you that whatever Peter does affects Miguel and vice versa. And while in concept it's pretty cool, it's just a bunch of scripted events that play out exactly the same way. Presentation-wise, yeah, it's pretty slick, but you'll never have the choice between uh, making Miguel chew on the wiring inside a security console, thereby allowing Peter to control a mech or something, or, you know, not doing that, which results in no mech. If this game had split-screen or online co-op, then imagine the possibilities. Then you could have had instances of making your buddy's game harder or easier. <laughs> Wait, why did they just do that? Oh, right. When you get down to it, it's just marketing spin. Quantum causality? you were way ahead of your time. I don't want to keep rolling this hard on the negatives, but I will. Mobility! It's very important to the spider experience, but unfortunately outside of some older 8 or 16-bit titles, Edge of Time has some of the most limited. It's primarily the same as what was seen in, yeah, but that game made up for it with more intricate levels and much larger open spaces to get your web on. With an Alchemex though, it's rare you'll be swinging for more than 10 seconds as you spend most of the adventure running around or using a web zip. If you do attempt some good old web swinging, you'll find yourself often overshooting your target as the areas you're in are way too small. It's just more precise to get around by doing anything else. So if you are a web swinging enthusiast or put Spider-Man 2 on a pedestal, then there's a high likelihood you'll be disappointed with Edge of Time. On top of everything else, the campaign has this really awkward length where by the middle portion you can see some obvious padding, banal fetch quests, key hunts, and some ineffective narrative twists that add very little to the main story. However, if this stuff had been cut, then the game would have been too short, I think? As it stands, 5-7 to seven hours in just the Alchemax building is almost the worst of both worlds. I'd honestly have rather had a tighter 3-4 to four hour game that didn't drag and was lower priced and sold digitally. In hindsight though, considering what happened to the Activision Spider-Man games, maybe that's not the best choice either. 
Now, back to that padded middle section. It revolves around two story threads that are so hastily thrown in there, I almost forgot about them. Both Mary Jane and Black Cat, specifically, show up in the middle to give the player a break from chasing and being chased by atrocity. Oh, did I forget to mention that Sloan, Anti-Venom, and Bit Player Dr. Octopus fuse halfway into the story to become a new villain? Felicia is the real culprit here, coming complete with an awful backstory and a middling, uninteresting boss fight. While I get this was meant to mix things up, it's handled really clumsily. If you want to throw a random boss in there to job, that's for the likes of Rhino or Shocker 2099. Ah, then you could have had Barnes go Shocker! Mary Jane's brief section fares a bit better, because even though the gameplay of trying to chase slash save her is, well, extremely irritating, it at least has a narrative purpose. <laughs> It strengthens the bond between Miguel and Peter, so, you know, that's something. Now, I know this negative section is, you know, a lot, but that's what's frustrating about almost all of Beanox's Spider-Man output. There's always some concession or a crunch period that was holding them back, and that was definitely the case with Edge of Time. Another security matrix. Great. As for the versions, one of my favorite topics, well, Edge of Time released on the 360, the Wii, PS Triple Ballin, the DS, and 3DS. The Wii is essentially a graphically stripped down version of its HD counterpart, just with reduced quality and textures, lighting, you know, the regular stuff. Overall, visually, it fares pretty poorly when compared to the Wii version of Shattered Dimensions because Edge of Time did away with all of the stylistic cell shading. It goes all out on the 7th generation HD look, as you've probably noticed. You take one look at this and you go, oh yeah, that's a 360 game. While the content of both console branches are the same, it should be noted that the Wii version completely lacks the DLC Identity Crisis suits. The DS version, sadly, was not a Gryptonite joint who made the fantastic Web of Shadows and Shattered Dimensions portables. This one is by Other Ocean, and it simply isn't up to snuff. While it retains the search action formula that Gryptonite adopted, it just feels more basic and by the numbers, and not to mention, it goes for ugly, stiff little sprites that lack the charm of the chunky little 3D models typified by Gryptonite's superhero back catalog. I do have to give it props for its nice little comic book cutscenes, which are made more authentic by actual voiceovers, a rarity for a DS game of this style. Spider-Man, what are you doing here? Stopping you from doing something monumentally stupid. Trying to stop me, perhaps actually succeeding? Unlikely. Finally, we have the 3DS version, which I was hoping was going to be its own weird exclusive thing, but it's essentially a button-controlled port down of the Wii, just even uglier. When you think about stunners like RE, Revelations, Dead or Alive, or Kid Icarus, you know this system could do a lot better when stuff is tailor-made for it. I would have loved like a 2.5D side-scroller with little 3D web swing sections, you know? Hey, can we change something in the future so we can get that now, please? Finally, I have to give out about the lack of a PC release because going back to the 360 original was, well, a little rough. While the frame rate performs solidly, which it should, it's not open world, the limited resolution options and lack of graphical toggles is sorely missed. It's bizarre that the last two big Spider titles did get PC ports, just not this. I can't really fault Beanox here though. If Activision didn't care, that wasn't something even Quantum Causality could fix. While I wish it weren't so, Edge of Time being squeezed in between two much bigger projects was a bad move for a variety of reasons. It fractured Beanox's workforce and, in my opinion, it led to some Spider-Man burnout. In five years, Activision had them pump out four games, with the latter three not being given nearly enough time to playtest and polish. If Activision absolutely needed another Spider-Man for 2011, it probably should have been farmed out to a smaller studio with Beanox's support slash supervision, but it could be that the sudden collapse of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4 threw a big sticky monkey wrench into those plans. I don't know. Regardless, the reception to Edge of Time was far more mixed than Shattered Dimensions, due to it being almost half the length and lacking the same variety and ambition. However, some fans still have really fond memories of this game, which seems to be the core of a newfound appreciation of what it did manage to do with all the constraints it was shackled with. 
Both this and Shattered Dimensions are the last really wild comic book style Spider-Man games we've seen, and people miss them so much that Activision were set to release remasters on both the Xbox One and PS4. They were shaping up to be pretty basic re-releases, much like what we saw with Ultimate Alliance or Deadpool. But of course, business got in the way. Sony's somewhat confusing acquisition of the character was the roadblock here. Activision wanted to re-release both games to piggyback off the hype from Insomniac's upcoming effort, but for whatever reason, the whole mother shocking thing was cancelled. As it stands, all of Activision's Spider titles were delisted back in like 2014, so the only way you can get them easily today is eBay or your local bargain bin. And with that, we are nearing the end of this time-twisting journey. Now, despite my issues with the gameplay flow and the progression, honestly, Edge of Times' story, characterization, and combat are all worth revisiting, as long as you temper your expectations going in that this is a brief action beat-em-up spin-off and not Shattered Dimensions 2. So with that said, I give Spider-Man Edge of Time 2.9, no, three Val Kilmer heads out of five. If you arachnophiles out there want me to review any other Spider titles, let me know in the comments below, swing over to my Twitter, or hit up the offices of the Daily Flophouse VIP Patribugle. God, I gotta change that name. Excelsior, true believers, and I'll see you next time on the Mediocre Spider-Mat.